thank you, everybody. Uh, this is our fourth uh, webinar uh, for our, our summer teacher sessions for 2020. We also call it Transplant Immunology 101. And uh, for those uh, who are attending for the first time and who don't know us, uh, I'm Sandra Lissandrini. Uh, I'm a senior investigator in the Center of Transplantation Sciences, and I'm one of the co-organizers along with Drs. Leo Riella uh, and uh, Thiago Borges. And um, I think Leo wants to say a few words before we go on. Leo? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. We're, we're really happy uh, to have uh, all of you kind of join us. Please uh, keep giving us feedback. Uh, we had about uh, 40 participants on our last uh, webinar uh, with Dr. Uh, uh, David Sachs. Uh, we'll put that uh, online. We have recorded the videos. We're just uh, organizing it and we will play some of them uh, online. And uh, I'll pass the word to um, Thiago to introduce our speaker today. So welcome everybody. Um, just to remind the audience, please mute yourself during the lecture. Uh, if at any point during the presentation you have a question for the speakers, submit your question by using the chat tab, or you can use the Q&A tab, or you can hit raise your hand button that we can connect you to the speaker later. Um, they are all they are all can be found in the bottom of your screen. We will take most of questions after the webinar. If there any any question that we don't get it, we will post a written response uh, to those on the website and notify you when the, the answers are available. If you have a pressing question, we can interrupt the uh, speaker to answer it right away. So please don't be shy. Uh, during the webinar, if you experience any technical problem, please communicate uh, with me there, uh, via chat. So you can just hit my name and then you can send me a private message that I can uh, help you with the technical issues. So now is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jay Fishman as the fourth speaker of our series. Uh, Dr. Fishman is a professor at, uh, of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He's a associate director of the MGH Transplantation Center and the director of Transplant Infectious Disease and Compromised Host Program at the MGH. And today's um, webinar is titled Infection Transplantation and immunocompromised hosts and COVID-19. So now I turn over to Dr. Fishman to begin today's seminar. Thank Thanks you. very much. So let me get started. I was told that I was obligated to cover both infection and transplantation as well as COVID-19 because Leo needed a refresher. Um, so I will do that. Um, thank you all for inviting me. Um, I'm going to go through this. These are my disclosures. I have lots of conflicts, um, none of which are relevant. Um, just a general point, which is that amongst this group of individuals, our organ transplant recipients, our diabetics, our uh, end-stage dialysis-dependent individuals, people on low-dose prednisone, patients with aspergillus, patients on biologic agents and the like for rheumatologic disease, all of them need to be considered immunocompromised in one way or another. Often they don't have fevers, but they may present with fevers when they have infections. And we have no good assays to measure immune competence, and that's immune competence relevant to their risk of infection or for their risk of rejection. So if any of you are working for any of the companies that are making those assays, I would sell your stock right now. The question, therefore, is you should always avoid or minimize immunosuppression. And of course, that's not the business we're in because we know, for example, the kidney example, that mortality is much lower for people who have kidney transplants than in patients who are on dialysis. So overall, patients do better with organ transplants well taken care of. Jay, it's complicated. Are you able to do uh, the full screen? Um, the slideshow? I think so. Screen. Beautiful. Better? Yes. Next time, could you just raise your hand, please, sir? Yes. Um, so um, overall, the problem with transplant infectious disease is that the uh, presentations may look alike for wildly different diagnoses. So the take home message, if you go to sleep right now, is always make a specific diagnosis because we need to know if people are having graft rejection. We need to know, for example, in this example, renal transplant recipients 
who look vaguely similar in terms of their presentation, in terms of having um, a low white count in their urine with no fever, no uh, white cells in their urine, but white, an elevated white blood cell count with a lymphocele, um, people with BK polyoma virus or CMV and graft rejection or PTLD may all look vaguely similar, but the therapies are all very different. And so as a result, we really need to uh, make specific diagnoses in all of these. And the diagnosis of infection is more complicated because of the immunosuppression, because they have diminished signs of inflammation, multiple simultaneous processes are going on at once, which may be infection and rejection, infection and uh, drug toxicity. Infection is often advanced or disseminated at the time of presentation. Uh, antimicrobial resistance is a problem. All of our drugs, including the antimicrobial agents, have side effects. All of our patients, because of the nature of transplantation, have anatomic and surgical alterations, and the immune deficits are cumulative, and I'll talk more about that in the middle. So for those of you who are interested in a compact kind of educational experience, here it is. This is everything you need to know about transplantation. Anything anybody else tells you is irrelevant. So this is what you need to know multiple processes going on at once. We're imaging often because we need to know if there are drainable collections, if there are issues with the graft. Prophylaxis generally works and generally tells us what they don't have, but doesn't always work. Drug interactions are very important. You need to know that the calcineurin inhibitors cause pre-renal vasoconstriction and also will interact with any other drug that has nephrotoxicity to accelerate renal toxicity. You need to know that the azole drugs that I use or the aminoglycosides will impact not only calcineurin levels, therefore, but also kidney toxicity. We need, need sometimes to sacrifice kidneys to save a life in terms of infection. I've mentioned the urgency of specific diagnosis. We look at microbiology to the best we can. Cytomegalovirus is always a problem, but generally presents with a low white count, not a high white count, and graft rejection is always a problem. In terms of specific organ, organisms and infections, I've mentioned some of them in this table here. It'll be on the exam at the end of my talk, so you should pay attention to all of those. With all of that in mind, we rely on demonstration of anatomy and often tissue histology for diagnosis, which means we do biopsies, which means we do a lot of CT and MRI scans. Antibody testing is not terribly useful for diagnosis. So we tend to rely on demonstration of nucleic acids or proteins, ELISAs, for example. Early and aggressive therapy is necessary and we work closely with the surgeons to make sure that we debride infections when we can, because antibiotics are less useful in this population than in others. How often do people get infected or animals get infected? It's the same. It depends on how good a surgeon you have and the intensity of immune suppression that's used for a specific organ. Fever occurs in fewer individuals because steroids and MMF in particular are associated with lower white counts and lower fever incidence of fever. So on the clinical service, we'll see people with perforated bowels who have absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. And you can push on their belly and they say, feels great doc, nothing going on. So we have to be suspicious for atypical signs. When they do have fever, about 80% of the time they have some infection, but graft rejection, viral infections, et cetera, always have to be considered. Heart and lung transplant recipients have the greatest rate of infection, and as a result, the greatest rate of rejection as well. Over time, what we've seen are shifts in the organisms that we see routinely. We see non-tuberculous mycobacteria, bacteria with multiple drug resistance, various fungi and viruses that are resistant, and parasites. And the reason is, in part, in the clinical sphere, 
is because we are doing well with better immunosuppressive regimens. They are also because we're transplanting patients from broader socioeconomic and geographic backgrounds. We're seeing shifts in nosocomial flora. Every time we shift routine prophylaxis, we change the bacteria and fungi, et cetera, that we see. The immunosuppression we're using is better, but more intensive. So we, as a result, see infections that we didn't see in the past. And in part, in my lifetime in particular, we've seen improved diagnostic assays, particularly the molecular assays that we come to consider routine right now. So my teacher, Bob Rubin, in the 70s, used to say that infection, the risk for infection is this semi-quantitative relationship between what the patient sees, their epidemiologic exposures, including latent infections and including those from the organ donor in this conceptual framework that I'll come back to in a second called the net state of immune suppression. In terms of epidemiology, it's what they see. So if they saw tuberculosis or non-tuberculous mycobacteria or went to an area that has strong aloides or they like to eat raw meat, et cetera, those are distant exposures that can reemerge in the setting of immunosuppression. Then you have the problem of recent exposures, nosocomial exposures, which we would anticipate would be related to surgery, would be related to the environment in which they live, and would be derived from the organ donor. And this has been an area of, of course, a very important research in xenotransplantation. So what we do routinely is we take in patients, we do this entire exam, this the serologic testing, and we vaccinate to try to prevent infection during the time when they are immunosuppressed. The importance of an individual epidemiologic exposure relates to the nature of the immune suppression we're giving. But in transplant, because we're doing immunosuppression that affects T cells primarily, but also B cells and neutrophils are innate immune function, you can see all of the different organisms come to play depending on the depth and duration of immunosuppression over time. The net state of immune suppression is this conceptual framework of all of the factors that go together that may contribute to the risk for opportunistic infection. The biggest driver, as I've mentioned, is the immunosuppressive therapy they're on, but not just what drugs are they taking now, but what drugs have they been on before and in what sequence? Why does that matter? If I use induction therapy that's T cell depleting, I may activate cytomegalovirus. I can then perpetuate that viral infection by giving calcineurin inhibitors to perpetuate the T cell deficit. If I don't do induction or I don't do the immunosuppression subsequently or I reverse the order, it may have a different effect. In addition to that, there's all those things that we do to patients that put them at risk for opportunistic infections. We put in catheters and lines and leave them in too long, and we routinely do this both in patients and in animal studies. We disrupt their microbiomes by giving too many antibiotics. We may vaccinate them or forget. We may ignore underlying immune deficiencies, and malnutrition is an important one and viral co-infections are also an important component. Now, when I was teaching immunology in college, this is what the immune system looked like. So it was very easy. And these cells not only were there, but they weren't allowed to talk to each other. And what's happened now is we have a whole new set of cells with indefinite subsets and the immunologic networks and interactions are increasingly complex. And so, we lesion various aspects of these immune networks. And what actually happens is we may or may not be able to predict all of the downstream effects. But Leo has been nice enough to simplify the immune system. And I've improved his, his diagrams just to show that we're doing all of these things simultaneously. But in the individual, we have to count in things like the genetics of their immune response, their pharmacogenetics in terms of metabolism of the various uh, drugs we give in terms of the net state of immune suppression that we're going to see. 
I would point out just one thing, which is to say that when we do T cell depletion, particularly, that the duration of the effect is actually quite a bit longer than what we anticipate. So while cell counts may start to come back, the immune deficiency persists, which is a good thing in terms of preventing rejection early while we're finding drug levels, but a bad thing in terms of risk for opportunistic infection. And this again is Leo's, which is basically to say, it's easy when you have a standardized protocol to know when an individual is at greater or lesser risk. So what happens is we put them on triple therapy and we develop skill with that group of drugs in terms of the individual's risk for infection. Okay, so if you take all of those things and put them together, what's the risk for infection? Well, intuitively, the greatest risk is at the beginning. They're on the highest dose of drugs. They're getting induction therapy. But in fact, the period of most intensive immunosuppression is after the drugs have a period of time to kick in, three to four weeks after immune suppression starts. The driving feature early is, the, as I mentioned, the quality of your surgical team and exposure to in infection in the environment or from the donor and recipient. All those infections that they see early are colonizers so that you will see them again if you end up treating for graft rejection much later. Again, as I've mentioned, the common variables are what regimen are you using for a particular animal now? So you can't keep tweaking your system and then figure you're gonna learn something about the risk for infection. Standardized immunosuppressive protocol, and then you tweak it on an individual basis when they get sick. All right, let me pause there and stop for a second because what I'm gonna to try to do now is move into uh, talking about coronavirus just because it's fun and because it's what we're doing lately. But do I have any urgent questions from anybody before I move into COVID? Seeing none? I think it, no, I think no, not for now. It's done, okay, good. That's the way we like it. All right, so let's talk about what happened when COVID hit Massachusetts. So it has completely and hopefully permanently altered multidisciplinary transplantation. And right now, uh, having gotten our patients, our COVID patients out of the ICU, we have a chance to look back. So what are we looking back at? We had reduced organ procurement and transplantation for a period of time. We had new COVID-19 screening requirements. We didn't do live donation for a period of time. We did do transplant and critically ill transplant recipients who were co-infected with COVID. I can talk about some of those later. We have not yet heard about donor-derived COVID infections. Um, we expect that it probably occurs. And there are over 6,000 virtual visits, not counting telephone calls, at the MGH in the three months that we tracked them. We learned how to do remote medical and surgical screening, blood work, multidisciplinary evaluations, and to use some newer technologies, particularly around the area of lung transplantation. As I say, it has been tailing off in Massachusetts. What are the coronaviruses? I'm not gonna go through all of this in detail, but the coronaviruses have these spike proteins, which give them the name, the corona, which have as their major feature the ability to jump species. So you go to markets and places where they have a lot of different species together and the ability to exchange genetic material between species occurs. The spike protein is the receptor and coprotein that binds to cells. The ACE2 receptor is the primary receptor for SARS-CoV-2. The host protease promotes membrane envelope fusion and non-structural viral proteins modulate the immune responses. What's interesting about SARS-CoV-2 is that you need to know that we've had six other, at least, coronaviruses that circulate in the human population, but they are minor species. They do cause upper respiratory infection, but they don't cause the same kinds of disease. Why not? What's happened with SARS-CoV-2 
at least in some limited studies, is that it's displaced other respiratory viruses in the general population. We don't know what's going to happen with the upcoming flu season. And I should say that the first patient I saw with SARS-CoV-2 was co-infected with influenza. So co-infection can occur. But you do need to know that when SARS-CoV-2 is in circulation, it tends to dominate the viral picture overall. It does have zoonotic potential like the other uh, human coronaviruses, and it spreads efficient, very efficiently. What's important is that we don't have pre-existing immunity in the human population. So as a result, we have very little protection. There's some cross-reactive T cell immunity, but in the absence of pre-existing immune memory, we are basically naive individuals. And what we're seeing is it's displacing all of the other respiratory viruses in a population that is non-immune by and large. The furin target is this little piece of nucleic acid that was probably obtained from the pangolin. You can look it up afterwards, but basically this scaly anteater type um, animal. And when that, that as an intermediate host before it went to the bat and then into humans, and therefore, the main effect of this was to increase viral replication on human cells so that it became a much more effective virus for human infection. SARS-CoV-2 mutation rates are not great. However, there seem to be about six or so clades that have emerged. And they, by recent reports, and this has not yet been confirmed, seem to have slightly different um, physiologic and uh, medical presentations uh, between the six different strains. So there may be differences, for example, between the Italian strain and the one that was seen in Northern Europe and the ones that are seen, for example, in South America. The implications are, of course, that there isn't a lot of selection pressure because we haven't seen it before and there isn't cross-reactive immunity for the others um, the other interesting feature is like other viruses in the compromised host, all of these viruses stimulate an innate immune response and the associated inflammation has been associated with the development of adult respiratory distress syndrome so that they get severe inflammation at a time that they don't have very good uh, host immunity. So the role of the Hunan market in China, which has been blamed for all of this, is probably misplaced. I don't know if you can see my marker, but there are individuals that probably had SARS-CoV-2 before the preparations for the Chinese New Year. And what the Chinese New Year preparations probably did was brought together the pangolins, the bats, the people, and crowds, and allowed virus that was already somewhat established in the human population to spread much more ra rapidly. That's not to say it got a bad rap, but basically that's what happened. The difference from prior coronavirus outbreaks, you're all familiar with probably minor coronaviruses, but SARS and the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And just to summarize that, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome had a very high case mortality rate and was really by exposure to camels in the Middle East. And so that was a unique virus. The SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 had different intermediate hosts, but used the same receptor. The mortality rate, the case fatality rate is about 9% in SARS-CoV. Hard to determine right now because we don't know what the population is that's infected in, um, in the world, probably somewhere closer to about 1% than it is to 9%. We'll talk about other features in a second. The interesting thing about the prior outbreaks is the huge number of copies seen in the lungs of patients who are immunosuppressed as compared to those who are not immunosuppressed. So in my timeline, this period from about three weeks to about six months is when you start seeing the impact of community-acquired respiratory viruses like SARS, like 
uh, SARS-CoV-2, like the herpes viruses and others. And as you see them emerge, that you would expect the impact of virus viral infection to be greater in our transplant population. We have this large family of viruses that affect our immunosuppressed transplant patients because we target T cell immunity by and large with our immunosuppressive regimen. I've already alluded to the fact that these viral infections are particularly important in transplant recipients, not just because they cause bad pneumonia. CMV causes fever and neutropenia, hepatitis and the like. All of these viruses like influenza causes pneumonia have what we call direct effects. With SARS, we're more concerned with the indirect or immunomodulatory effects, which are cause systemic immunosuppression. So somebody has CMV, and then about two weeks later, they may get pneumocystis or aspergillus. They also provoke a very brisk inflammatory response or cytokine release syndrome, which for COVID-19 has been the hallmark of infection. The inflammation can contribute to graft rejection or graft versus host disease in those that receive stem cell or bone marrow transplants and can block the generation of tolerance. In addition, viral infection tends to contribute to proliferation of cells. So in the heart transplants to accelerate atherogenesis, in lung transplants to diffuse alveolar damage and fibrosis, that is a hallmark of lung transplantation, but also of COVID-19, but anogenital cancers and uh, Epstein-Barr virus associated post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder as well. So triple effects of viral infection in transplantation. What's interesting about SARS-CoV-2 is the heterogeneity of the presentation. So you can see multiple or single presentations from this long list of my diagram that in an individual patient. So obviously dominated by the respiratory illness that can progress to adult respiratory distress syndrome and failure, but also we've seen stroke and neurologic disorders. We see some unusual skin findings. We've seen people with myocarditis and pericarditis so, and heart failure, elevated creatinines. About 30% of patients have diarrhea. And then there's shock syndrome, systemic disease, thrombocytopenia and inflammation that is also very important in this patient population. So they may come in and present with a relatively mild chest X-ray and then present very and progress, I should say, very rapidly to needing intubation and oxygen support, as opposed to this lady who has every single comorbidity known to man and did fine and ended up going home after COVID. Now, our own series were summarized by Matt Roberts, our transplant ID fellow, who looked at our admitted patients uh, with COVID-19, or admitted transplant patients, as I should say, and out of 32 of those, I'll just mention some of the odd features. 25% had no fever. 31% had no chest x-ray findings. So this heterogeneity is very common. And then in terms of separating the people who ended up needing intensive care unit therapy or didn't, the only thing that you could tell is those that were sickest when they hit the emergency room were the ones that tend to progress to ICU requiring care. Now, the diagnosis of COVID-19 and pulmonary infection is in part a correlate of the fact that the highest receptor, the ACE2 receptor, is in the nose with a gradient going down into the lungs. But in fact, seen here in red, the binding of um, COVID-19, uh, you see this gradient that goes up to the nose so that nasopharyngeal swabs are high yield because that's where a lot of the virus is on the epithelial surface of the lungs and the nose. The problem is, is that one of the target cell types is the alveolar type two cell, which is the cell stem cell like that is responsible for lung repair. And when that's damaged, uh, recovery after injury via cytokines, via neutrophils, et cetera, is very much slowed. So patients 
even the ones that eventually get discharged, tend to be slow once they're intubated. And in part, this is a reflection of the intense cytokine storm that's generated both in the lungs and in the periphery. And so we measure a whole variety of biomarkers of inflammation, and you may have heard that, in addition to the viral load and immunoglobulins, we have a whole series of inflammatory biomarkers, none of which is exactly predictive of how an individual patient's going to do, just a measure of how sick they are. The other thing is we don't normally measure these markers. So we don't actually know um, how they would look in a normal individual with pneumonia or a transplant patient with pneumonia. So we have been following them intensively in our COVID patients, but in fact, we don't know the meaning of all of them particularly well. What we do know is that having multiple comorbid conditions is bad. And of course, most of our transplant patients have comorbid conditions, but you can look at the, on the left-hand side, that older people tend to do less well. People with pre-existing lung disease or kidney disease or diabetes, cardiovascular disease and obesity tend to do less well. The labs, those with the highest inflammatory markers tend to have more of a disease progression and may be more likely to acquire ICU care. So that in those of our patients who were transplant patients who had high daily C-reactive proteins or D-dimers or low albumins, they tended to be more likely to be admitted to the intensive care unit. But some of the markers that people swore by early on, like the absolute lymphocyte count, didn't, med didn't go so well in terms of predicting outcomes. So this overly complicated diagram, and it's still a work in progress, so happy to have comments, but suggested to me that there were two clinical phases of SARS-CoV that were emphasized in the organ transplant recipient. Once exposed, it takes about three to five days for symptoms to occur. That's our best window of opportunity to reduce immunosuppression and to apply effective antiviral therapies like remdesivir if they work. After that, you start getting the activation of a native and, and adaptive immunity, and you start seeing all the inflammatory markers go up, and that's when inflammatory, anti-inflammatory therapy is likely to have greatest efficacy like the dexamethasone that you've been hearing about in the press. So there's these two phases. A lot of our transplant patients didn't get terribly sick. We tended to admit a lot of them, but in fact, most of them did pretty well. But when they deteriorated in this point, they crashed quickly. And so at that point, we tended to reduce immunosuppression. We would replace it later and try to replace it with steroids or some other immunosuppressive therapy. So we had viremia and cytopathic effects, this over-exuberant immune response, ARDS and fibrosis of the lungs of those individuals, and some risk with intubation of bacterial and super infection that we would see going forward. Overall, about three to 5% of patients that came to the hospital got admitted. About 70% internationally get admitted when they've had a transplant. About a third get uh, admitted to the ICU. A third of those get intubated. And mortality once intubated, about 75%, so bad. Our overall mortality, MGH, was about 11%, much higher elsewhere. And in the United Kingdom, the large study um, had a hazard ratio for death of over four, but they don't intubate a lot of their older or transplant patients. So it's hard to make a direct comparison. When you do testing, you've heard about people who remain positive. Many of our transplant patients remain positive out to eight weeks. So it's really hard to interpret testing in these individuals. Big problem is the racial and ethnic disparities across Boston and elsewhere where blacks and Hispanics tend to do get hospitalized more often and do less well. And there are questions about whether or not, as in the MMF trials, whether or not uh, African-Americans may have a more exuberant inflammatory response 
and therefore may get more of the systemic inflammation than others. But in fact, um, they tend to come to care later. They have less social supports and tend to live in more crowded environments and tend to work in jobs where they are facing the public more actively. So their risk levels are much greater than the general population and they tend to have more comorbid conditions that aren't as well taken care of by the medical system. So that in general, our transplant and immunosuppressed populations do less well overall, but they have this biphasic illness that I referred to earlier. What do we do with immunosuppression? Don't know. And the reason we don't know is because first of all, there are no prospective studies. And second of all, we don't know whether or not, in fact, the immunosuppression may be partially protective against this exuberant inflammatory response. We just don't know. So we all hedge a little bit. Most of the people who have come out where we've done uh, what we've done at the MGH, which is perhaps a moderate reduction in tacrolimus, a reduction or stopping the MMF, but maintaining the steroids unless they have a um, exuberant inflammatory response, at which point we might add steroids or add an anti-IL-6 agent or something of that nature. There is some in vitro data suggesting that cyclosporin has an antiviral effect. I wouldn't put any of my good friends on calcineurin inhibitors um, to, to do that. Management of steroids uh, remains controversial. There is this one study that some of you may have seen, uh, the recovery trial in the New England Journal, which suggests that in people on mechanical ventilation or on oxygen, that there is a benefit of dexamethasone, but how much to give for how long and to which patients still remains a little bit obscure, um, but there does seem to be a benefit of beating back the inflammatory syndrome. So we reduce or stop the MMF. Um, mTOR inhibitors have a bad effect on pulmonary infection. So in general, we tend to switch the mTOR inhibitors for another class of agents. And because we've seen so many atypical infections with Vladicept in terms of viral infections, we tend to switch them to other types of immunosuppressive agents because of this pneumonia syndrome you can see with Vladicept. So that's basically it. We have this biphasic illness. We're developing immunosuppressive uh, antiviral therapies. We apply anti-inflammatory anti therapies when their markers start going up. And when their markers start going down, we replace their immunosuppression. It's a very slow course of recovery once people get intubated. And let me stop there. And I would be happy to take any questions that people may have. Thanks very much for inviting me.